Thank you, um, everyone, for uh, joining this web webinar this afternoon. Um, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Leonard Wigg. I'm a member here at Farris Building. Um, but before I came to Chambers, I worked for the government legal department. Um, and I uh, did a lot of litigation um, in public law claims where there was often a strong human rights element um, and damages claims. Uh, just in terms of the format of this webinar, um, there is a question and answer function um, that I encourage you to use, um, but I will take all the, the questions at the end. So when I've got through this walk, I'll, um, I'll answer any questions that might have um, been put in, 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 the, uh, in the chat. So just by way of overview, um, going to look at why, um, why bring a human rights claim, who do you bring a human rights claim against, um, what are the requirements uh, for bringing a human rights claim, and what sort of remedies are available uh, for uh, human rights claims. So in terms of why bring a human rights claim, sort of Two main, two main reasons. Um, the first is where there's no course of action um, in common law or by statute um, or, or, or a sufficient remedy. Um, and also um, in relation to the public authorities and, and their positive duties. And we, we're gonna look at both of those um, issues in, in a moment. We're also gonna look at um, why um, you might not want to bring a human rights claim um, because there are some circumstances where it would just be inappropriate to, to, to bring a claim under the Human Rights Act. So we're going to touch on that as well. Um, also, I should have mentioned by way of background, this, this is a, a very much an introductory level, this, this talk. Um, no uh, prior knowledge of human rights claims is required. Um, and it's hoped that in the future I might do um, more detailed uh, talks uh, looking at more specific aspects of human rights uh, in, in due course. So just by way of recap or, or looking at some of the, um, the, the actual uh, convention articles, um, what, what I'll do is I'll just pick through some of these um, and explain them in a little bit of detail. Um, so, in terms of Article 1 of the Convention, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, um, th that sets out the jurisdiction uh, that states um, operate in. Um, and primarily, it's territorial. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, uh, for example, where uh, a state is exercising control or public authority over uh, another territory, for example, in a time of conflict. Um, but primarily, it, it, it is territorial. Um, the Article 1 is also important, and we're going to look at, uh, uh, in this talk, at a lot of the positive duties that uh, public authorities owe, and really, um, Article 1 is the source of, of those pub, uh, uh, positive duties, um, because it, it places a burden on states uh, to um, ensure that human rights are protected, um, so it is an important article. Um, article 2, right to life, um, it's obviously relevant where dealing with a claim where somebody has died. It's also, um, it, it, it's, there is some jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights in relation to the right to life where the person hasn't died. Um, and that's quite important to, to bear in mind. So Article 2 may be engaged even though the person hasn't died. Um, but where the actions of the state um, have been such that there was a severe risk of death. In, in certain circumstances, that has been enough to engage Article 2. Um, it's relevant in uh, domestic proceedings uh, because, um, for example, uh, in fatal accidents, for example, uh, you don't need to prove dependency or a tort if you are reliant on Article uh, 2. Um, and Article 2 also um, carries with it a positive duty um, to protect life, so the state is under an obligation to take reasonable steps to protect someone's life. Um, and it also contains um, a duty to investigate, and usually that would be dealt with by way of in inquest. It is important to uh, remember that that duty is a general duty and um, may apply to um, all sorts of public authorities where somebody has died um, within their uh, care. Article 3, um, 
prohibition against torture and inhumane um, and degrading treatments. Now, um, you, you can probably see from the wording in that slide that you, you've got torture at one end of the, of the scale, but then you've got degrading treatment, which is a, a sort of lesser act at the other. And there is, to a, to, to a degree, a sort of sliding scale there, and it, 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 it always depends on the facts of a particular case. Um, but if you if you take the lowest end of de degrading treatment, um, that would certainly encompass all forms of abuse. So if you're dealing with a claim that contains um, abuse, um, you, 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 you might want to look at Article 3. Um, again, the state owes um, positive duties to protect people from abuse, um, and there's a duty to in investigate uh, where abuse has taken place um, or anything uh, contrary to Article 3. Um, some examples from uh, the European Court of Human Rights, Strasbourg jurisprudence, um, includes prisoners um, who have been denied access to their reading glasses, um, or uh, prisoners who have um, uh, special health conditions who have been exposed to uh, passive smoke, for example. So the thresholds can be uh, quite low, um, and also there is a, a sort of subjective element in some of that jurisprudence as to um, the, the personal circumstances of, of, of a person. So um, th these are all things to bear in mind um, in, in thinking about bringing a claim under the uh, Human Rights Act. Again, Article 4, just very briefly, um, freedom from slave uh, labour, uh, or uh, slavery or forced labour, sorry. Um, that um, includes people who have um, uh, are victims of trafficking. Um, it includes servitude, which is loosely defined, again, in, in Strasbourg jurisprudence. Um, and uh, it, it, it also contains the positive duty to protect people from those conditions um, and also uh, positive duty to investigate allegations of, of, of where there's been um, an alleged breach. Um, very briefly, Article 5, um, this normally applies in detention cases. Uh, or where somebody's liberty has been um, deprived. Um, the reason I mention it is um, also um, Article 5 is an exception, um, and we'll come on to this a bit more uh, further on in the talk, but under Article 5, subsection 5 of the European Convention, um, where there has been a breach of this particular article, a person is entitled to compensation as a right. So that kind of mirrors, the, the, for example, the sort of false imprisonment where um, once it's established, somebody's been uh, falsely imprisoned, they're entitled to damages per se. They don't need to prove a loss. And that's the same uh, with Article 5. It also contains positive duties. Um, I'm just going to move on from that and just look at, um, you, you, well, you probably heard me say a lot about positive duties, um, and I'm going to focus on that a little bit more now. And I just want to give two examples, really, of how this um, can play out in, in practice. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main reasons why you, would like to, why, why you might want to bring a claim under the Human uh, Rights Act is because there's no course of action under common law or statute, or the remedy that you seek um, it is, is not going to be effective uh, um, at, at the domestic level. Um, and uh, an example of that is Z versus UK. Now, in that case, um, a local authority who knew about abuse that was being um, committed against two children, um, they failed to stop or intervene in, 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 in that. Um, and the official solicitor brought a claim in negligence and breach of statutory duty. Uh, the House of Lords um, confirmed that there was no action, that, that there was no course of action there. Um, however, um, the, the claimants were awarded between £1,000 and £3,000 for injuries by the uh, Criminal Injuries Compensation Bureau, but nothing for the neglect. Um, now, when this case got to uh, Strasbourg, the European Court of Human Rights found that there had been a breach of the positive duty um, implied into Article 3 um, and awarded £32,000 uh, in damages. So that's an example of a breach of positive duty against the state. Um, and another example, more recent example, oh, sorry, just before I move, move on to that, I should also say that I, I think that Z versus UK was pre-Human Rights um, Act. So um, they, they had to go to Strasbourg to get that remedy. 
um, if, if that case were brought today, um, a domestic court would um, more than likely uh, make, make, make that finding. But uh, just moving on to um, the second case here, which is the Met Police versus uh, DSD. A uh, far more recent case, uh, 2018, where the Supreme Court uh, found that breach of Article 3 uh, in relation to the failure to investigate uh, a rape complaint, again, breach of the positive duty to investigate. Um, and in that uh, case, uh, the, the, the claimant was awarded over uh, £22,000 for depression caused um, by uh, the breach of Article 3, i.e. the failure to investigate. So there was um, medical evidence that affects and there was an injury caused um, by the breach. Um, and this was in addition to uh, the criminal injuries claim. So it's a separate heading uh, uh, for, for loss there for breach of uh, Article 3. Um, so those are two examples of um, the types of claim where you might want to think about um, asking, is there a positive duty involved, uh, failure to investigate, uh, uh, failure to protect, um, whether Human Rights Act claims can be a, a useful tool for a, a claimant. And we'll look at defences as well in just a moment. So as I've mentioned, there's the positive duty, just, just continuing this theme that the um, House of Lords has found that in relation to NHS trusts, uh, that there's a duty to ensure that hospitals uh, for which they're responsible employ competent staff and that they are trained to a high professional standard um, and have a, uh, the, sorry, that hospitals adopt systems of work which will protect the lives of their patients. So that's separate from the common law duty, it's separate from the statutory duty. This is a positive duty that arises from convention rights. Um, the case of Osman versus UK uh, is again a very important uh, case. It, it sets out what, what are known as the Osman principles. Um, and these are that where um, authorities know or ought to have known that there was a real risk um, of uh, a threat to life essentially. Um, and they fail to take measures uh, to avoid that risk, there'll be a breach. Um, and that applied um, in. Well, in, in that case, it related to Article 2, but again, it would relate to um, Article 3 or otherwise. Um, and it would apply also not just to the police, but other uh, responders. So that's um, uh, a useful uh, tool to remember um, that, that, that the Osman uh, principles, that they have now been um, firmly established in, in domestic jurisprudence as well. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's also important to bear in mind that then there are lots of cases where it's just probably not a good idea to bring a human rights claim. Um, and, and that is, for example, where you, you, the, the common law or statutory duty serves the purpose that you, you, you need sufficiently. Um, and uh, examples might be a tortious claim, um, say in negligence uh, for a road traffic accident, something like that. Um, you, 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 you're not going to need to bring a human rights claim necessarily. It's where you're looking at maybe whether the police investigated it properly, um, the extent of the duty to investigate if somebody died, things of that nature that is more likely um, that you're going to want to go down more of a human rights route, sort of underpin any other duties um, in your claim. Uh, so um, there are also just some disadvantages that we'll, we'll, we'll touch on further in the talk as well about um, the limitations uh, that human rights uh, claims uh, suffer, that, that they uh, can only be brought against the public authority, there's much stricter time limit and the remedies are discretionary. So the second part, we're just going to look now at um, who do you bring your claim against. So primarily, you're going to bring your claim against public authorities. Now, Section 6.1 of the Human Rights Act states it's unlawful for a public authority to act in any way uh, which is incompatible with convention rights. Now, this is what is termed as a vertical claim. And what that means, really, it's, it's individual versus state, states being the public authority. Now, that's where the course of action in human rights claims uh, lie. And we're going to look at some examples of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that individuals suing each other in what, what are horizontal claims don't need to be aware of um, human rights issues, uh, and, and we'll look at that as well. 
Now, the question is, what is a public authority for the purposes of the Act? Um, it includes a court under Section uh, 63A, and that's important, perhaps even more important for claims uh, uh, between individuals. Um, but the definition of a public authority under the Act, under Section 63B, um, is a bit woolly. Um, it's any person certain of whose functions are functions of the public nature. Um, not particularly helpful, um, other than it excludes the uh, Houses of Parliament. Thankfully, um, the House of Lords, in a case called Aston Cantlow, um, looked at this and decided that there were things called core public authorities and non-core or hybrid public authorities. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at those in just a moment. Essentially, question involves considering the nature and function uh, involved, which must be public. So just because you're acting for a private company, if they're carrying out a public function, you may need to consider whether or not they're vulnerable to a claim um, brought under the Human Rights Act. In terms of core public bodies, Aston Cantlow um, states, this is a, a House of Lords decision, uh, states um, that carries out the function of governments that would engage the responsibilities of the United Kingdom before uh, the Strasbourg organs. So essentially in that case is like, look at it from Strasbourg's perspective, um, are they engaging human rights? Uh, helpful to a degree. Um, then the second case that I've referred to is Quark Fishing versus Foreign Office. Uh, here, it, it, the, the House of Lords say that it's so obviously uh, have the character of a public authority, it's not necessary to mention them. So this is essentially, it speaks for itself, that the core public authority would include the police, the NHS, local authorities, central government, and the like. Um, that it's, it's so obviously a public authority, you don't really need to worry about it. So perhaps the more technical um, issue really is, is in relation to non-core public authorities, hybrid public authorities, essentially. Now, if you're in um, this, this area, you might want to look at the case of YL versus Birmingham City Council, um, which provides a little bit of guidance as to whether or not um, an entity is a non-core hybrid uh, public authority. Um, and it has some non-exhaustive guidance in that case, some of which I've referred to here, whether they receive uh, public funding, their statutory powers, or are they exercising statutory powers, taking the place of the state and carrying out the function of the state. Uh, government regulates or supervises them. So those are the kind of things you're looking for in determining whether or not um, the entity is a public authority for the purposes of the uh, Human Rights Act. Now, some, some ones that have already uh, been caught by this are G4S. So they provide, um, as a private contractor, run custody suites. Uh, they um, are, are, are non core pub public authorities for the purposes of the Human Rights Act. Also, private care homes. Now, um, there is a statutory provision, I can't remember it off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, that says that they are acting, um, that public care homes are carrying out a public function. So they're, they're within the remit of public authorities for the purpose of the Act. Does not include uh, network rail for some reason. Uh, there's a decision that in that case, they just, the, the, the High Court decided that they weren't a public authority. So um, in terms of defending uh, Claim if, if you are acting for somebody who's established as a public authority, um, one of the uh, core defences that you might want to look at is under section two, uh, sorry, uh, section six, subsection two of the Human Rights Act. And that says that as a result of one, of, uh, one or more provisions of primary legislation, the authority could not have acted differently. Um, or or uh, subsection 2b, uh, in the case of one or more provisions of or made under primary legislation which cannot be read or given effect in a way which is compatible with the convention rights, the authority was acting so as to give effect to or enforce those provisions. Um, so essentially, was, was the public authority following primary legislation? Was it doing what legislation told it to do? Um, if so, then um, there is uh, it, that's a defence to a claim under the Human Rights Act. 
or could the, author, uh, could the uh, legislative power that um, governs the authority be read in such a way as to give effect to the convention right? Um, is another way uh, under B. Um, to put that into practice, the case of um, GC versus the Met. So in that case, it related to uh, the retention or the indefinite retention of DNA, sus, uh, uh, DNA samples or, or biometrics um, obtained from uh, suspects. And um, the court decided that the, the, the provision under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act um, could be read in a way that was uh, that, that, that meant that they would not be retained indefinitely and therefore there was no breach of Article 8. So that's an illustrative example of, of these, these principles. Now, as I mentioned, um, the, the claims under the Human Rights Act brought mainly uh, or primarily against public authorities, but that doesn't mean they don't have a bearing on claims between private persons. So um, if we just look at some of those principles briefly now. So um, in McDonald's and McDonald, the Sup Supreme Court um, said in relation to contractual obligations, it, i.e. the Human Rights Act, is not directly enforceable between uh, private citizens so as to alter their contractual obligations. Um, so it, 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 in terms of the uh, purely contractual obligations, it doesn't have a bearing. Um, but when we look at section 6.1 um, and section 6.3, uh, sorry, section 3, and, and we'll also look at another section in just a moment, you can see that the court has to take into account private individuals' convention rights in determining or adjudicating disputes between private individuals. So um, uh, um, we'll look at section three just for a moment and, and, and just see there that the court tribunal give effect to primary and subordinate uh, legislation in a way that's incompatible with convention rights. Um, it also applies to common law rights, um, and that was set out in the case of Venables uh, versus News Group, Newspapers Limited. Um, where Lady Butler Sloss uh, stated the duty on the court, in her view, is to act uh, compatibly with convention rights in adjudicating upon existing common law courses of action and includes a positive as well as a negative obligation. So in determining, um, well, let me put it like this, it, it, where you have a dispute between private individuals, the court is under a duty to um, act compatibly under Section 6.1, it also has to give effect to primary and subordinate legislation pursuant to section three um, it, 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 in a way that's compatible with convention rights. And it also has to interpret the common law um, in a manner that's compatible with convention rights. So although there's no course of action between individuals, their convention rights are to a degree still um, relevant. It's quite complicated. Uh, in dealing with this, but I think uh, Baroness Hale kind of summed it up neatly in Campbell uh, versus uh, MGN. She said, the Human Rights Act does not create any new course of action between private persons. But if there is a relevant course of action applicable, the court, as a public authority, which is section 6 one point, must act compatibly with both parties' convention rights. Where existing remedies are available, the court not only can, but must balance the competing convention rights of the parties. So if you're ever stuck on this point, just read this, this section again, because it is helpful in summarizing it. Um, also in relation to individuals or, or equally public authorities, um, claims against public authorities, section 2.1 of the Human Rights Act requires UK courts to take into account um, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. It's not binding on domestic courts like in our common law precedent system. Um, and there are examples where UK courts have refused to follow um, uh, the, the Strasbourg jurisprudence. Um, examples of that are normally where you, you, you have conflicting decisions from the European uh, Court of Human Rights, or um, they're just unclear. Um, and um, DSD is an example where elements of uh, Strasbourg jurisprudence was not followed um, by the U U UK Supreme Court. 
So just because you have a, um, something uh, set out in, in Strasbourg jurisprudence doesn't mean the court has to, has to follow it. Um, something to bear in mind. Okay, so part three, uh, looking at the requirements for bringing a human rights uh, uh, claim. Now, um, limitation, victim status, just satisfaction, we'll look at all of those uh, briefly in just a moment. It's probably right to say that just satisfaction, which is, relates to um, the award of remedies, um, isn't a requirement for bringing a claim, but it is a requirement for getting a remedy. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that in just a moment. First of all, limitation, um, really important here if you're acting for a claimant, but equally important if you're acting for a defendant. Um, Section 7.5 uh, of the Human Rights Act limits limitation um, in, in, in a normal, uh, so a non-judicial non review claim uh, to one year. If it was a judicial review, obviously it would be uh, three months. Um, but that's really important because one year is not a huge amount of time to get all your evidence and everything together from, from the, the alleged breach to getting your claim form um, served. So um, that is a, a, a relatively tight limitation period. Equally, if you're defending a claim, it's the first thing to look at because um, practitioners uh, may miss this. With personal injury, obviously, it being three years, um, if you want to tag on the human rights claim to that, the chances are by, by the time uh, you've issued, you may be out of time. So it's always, always worth uh, double checking that, that there isn't a limitation to fence if you're defending uh, these types of claim. There is a discretion to extend time um, under the Act. Um, however, I wouldn't count on it um, if you're a claimant. Um, the, uh, it, it, there are strong arguments when dealing with fundamental rights and the principle of legal certainty that might not apply as strongly to um, uh, normal limitation points. So, um, you know, it is really important to get your claim in that time. In Raybone um, versus um, uh, Penny uh, Care NHS uh, Foundation uh, Trust, um, the, the Supreme Court uh, said that section 33.3 of the Limitation Act, which sets out criteria for extending time, may be of relevance in determining whether or not to extend time. It may not be, it doesn't, it doesn't say that it definitely is um, a principle that needs to be looked at, um, but it may be. So um, that's something to also bear in mind. And the question is whether or not really the, the, the clock has started in certain cases. So in O'Connor versus B, the BSB, um, the, the act of a prosecution was considered a continuing act. So it may be that you need to think about whether or not the clock has actually started ticking. Um, I think in that case, uh, it, it, unless it was a continuing act, um, the, the, the claimant would have been out of time. Also, perhaps worth bearing in mind um, that if you have exhausted all your domestic uh, UK remedies and you want to bring your case to Strasbourg, um, you've only got four months, which is incredibly tight. Um, and that's a new change that came in in August this year uh, when Protocol 15 was um, added um, to the, the, the convention. So again, super um, uh, tight time uh, frame for that. Now you might think that's really unlikely that I'm gonna go to Strasbourg um, to get, rem uh, to get uh, relief, um, but you never know and uh, that the, the one reason why you might want to make an application is the UK court doesn't give your client an effective remedy. So it's not just whether or not there's a breach, it's really quite, you know, remedy orientated as well. So just bear in mind that ultra um, short four month deadline. Uh, no, the next uh, requirement for bringing the claim is, is victim status. Um, victim status is a sort of slightly unfortunate term, but essentially it means loco standi, so the, 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 the right of standing to bring the claim. Section 7, 1 and, uh, sorry, uh, Section 7, subsection 1 and 7 of the Human Rights Act um, you, you, says you, you must have victim status by reference to Article 34 of the Convention, which sets out the conditions in relation to victim status. Um, the definition of a victim uh, for, the, for Article 34 purposes is, is very wide, or, or it can be very wide, depending on the facts. 
So in class versus Germany, for example, um, it, it, it was considered that every German citizen might be a victim uh, uh, for the purposes of what, well, it's, it's Article 34 now, I think back then it was a different article, but um, in, in that case related to the security services tapping phones. So um, for the purposes of establishing it, the court was prepared to, to, to find that every single person in Germany could be um, a victim for, for, that, for those purposes. Um, the effect of uh, Article 34 really is to prevent um, what Strasbourg calls Actia Popularis, which is essentially claims brought in the public interest. So where a person doesn't actually have any uh, rights that have been allegedly uh, breached, um, that they're bringing it purely in the public interest. That's absolutely prohibited. Um, it, it's relevant if you're acting for an NGO, uh, because an NGO can't bring a, a claim uh, unless its own rights are breached. It may have rights under the convention, but unless one of those are breached, it can't bring a claim on behalf of somebody else. Um, and that principle was recently uh, looked at in the case of Reprieve and others versus the Prime Minister, where the High Court have found that Reprieve had no standing. Um, it was a judicial review challenging the Prime Minister's refusal to um, launch a public inquiry uh, looking at the UK, well, alleged UK complicity in um, extraordinary renditions following um, September the 11th. Uh, so an example there of someone having no standing to bring a human rights claim. Now, as I mentioned, just satisfaction isn't really a requirement to bring a claim, but it, it, it is a requirement if you want a remedy. So if a court's found that there's been a breach, you're, you're not home and dry in terms of getting damages or, or, or an award or, or a declaration or whatever you're seeking, unless you, well, except for Article 5.5, as I mentioned earlier, um, but, uh, uh, you, you, you have the additional hurdle of just satisfaction. Um, and the way the Human Rights Act deals with this um, is that see in section eight, um, the court uh, relief must be just and appropriate. And if you want damages, those damages must be necessary. Uh, section 8.4, which we'll come back to in a moment, um, looks at or, or says that, um, that the domestic court must take into account the principles applied by the European Court of Human Rights in relation to award for compensation under um, Article 41 of the Convention. And we're going to look at that a little bit more um, just towards the end of the um, talk. Um, it's also important to remember, I think, in advising on human rights claims, if you're acting for a claimant um, or equally if you're acting for defendants, that um, a finding of a violation may in itself be considered just and appropriate uh, without further awards. Um, and um, that, that, that does happen. Um, so, if that were to happen, you probably want a declaration in your order. Um, and and um, the, the, the power of the domestic court to make uh, awards or, 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 or to order these types of remedies um, depends on what powers they have um, already. So Section 81 says um, it, it court essentially may grant such relief or remedy or make such order within its powers. So if a court doesn't have power to grant damages, it can't, just because you brought a human rights claim before it doesn't mean that you're suddenly entitled to damages, that the court is bound by whatever powers it has already. That's particularly important when dealing with tribunal claims, because the tribunals are creatures of statute. Um, so that, that, that's something to bear in mind. As I mentioned earlier, uh, declaration, it, you always want a declaration, in my view, if you're acting for a claimant. Um, if anything, it gives you something to appeal against. Um, it's useful with it to go within the order. So you want to plead a declaration. Um, damages, uh, as I mentioned, only when uh, you have to prove that they're necessary um, for a breach of convention rights. Um, there's also a causation element that is often overlooked, but it does exist. Um, and Unlike in common law claims or breach of statutory duty claims, you don't have to prove but for the breach or a material co contribution. But you do need to show a loss of a real chance of a better outcome. 
Okay, so that's set out uh, in, in Greenfield. Um, it's, it's a modest threshold really to overcome. And I think that um, generally speaking in human rights claims, causation is rarely an issue. Um, this is the final slide. Um, we're looking at awards uh, of damages. So if you are pleading um, damages for, for a breach under the Human Rights Act, um, you, it, it's, it's a difficult area um, in, in calculating the awards, okay? So um, it's, it's hampered by the fact that there's no published guidelines um, by the Strasbourg Court. There are gui guidelines in Strasbourg, they just refuse to publish them. Um, and th that, that's problematic. So um, it's also um, sort of slightly aggravated by the fact that, that, that a lot of the Strasbourg decisions, particularly the older decisions, um, so um, uh, that th th they are inconsistent. I, I'm not sure how much truth there is in it, but it, but it was rumoured that when the court um, reduced the number of judges that were required in order to get rid of the backlog, some of the cases and started hearing them in, in smaller chambers, that that created um, a greater amount of inconsistency in, in awards. I'm um, not sure how much truth there is in that, but there, there certainly has been problems with inconsistency in awards. And then there's the question as well, do you actually need to look to Strasbourg for your award of damages, or do you look to domestic guidance? And again, unfortunately, there's sort of some conf conflicting authorities um, in relation to this. So. As I mentioned earlier, Article, uh, sorry, Section 84 of the Human Rights Act says um, that you should look to Strasbourg, um, Article 41, for guidance in relation to um, just satisfaction, um, which implies that Strasbourg is where you look to calculate your award for damages. And that was certainly the position taken uh, by Lord Bingham in Greenfield, it says you should look to, to Strasbourg um, for guidance on, on how much you should be awarded for a breach of convention rights. Generally speaking, it's acknowledged that um, Strasbourg jurisprudence in terms of its awards are much lower than the domestic court um, for uh, actions in a uh, breach of common law duty or statutory duties. Um, again, it's sort of rumoured that there may be a policy reason for this in sort of deterring people from bringing claims because they want money uh, in Strasbourg as opposed to what Strasbourg's primary purpose is, which is adjudicating convention rights. Um, not sure again how much truth there is in that or, or, or whether or not it's more of an evidential problem where people just don't evidence their loss for Strasbourg sufficiently. I, I don't know the answer to that, but... Um, the, the bottom line is, generally speaking, the awards are lower. Um, there has been a gradual move away from that position, um, and Alizarin versus MAD um, is an example of that. Uh, in that case, um, it, it, it was decided that actually you should look towards um, what you would get is in, in a domestic remedy first, and then kind of weigh that up against the Strasbourg jurisprudence um, to see um, what, what the just award should be, bearing in mind that the likely difference between the two. So there has been a sort of slight move away from um, exclusively looking at uh, Strasbourg jurisprudence in terms of assessing awards um, that, that domestic uh, guidance may be relevant. Um, and on that note, that concludes everything I have um, had to say. Um, I can't see that there are any questions in the um, chat box, so I think I'll leave it there. But uh, just just to say, um, also, um, sorry, just um, that um, yeah, as I said, said at the beginning, hopefully um, I'll be doing another talk um, on uh, human rights claims, perhaps looking in a bit more detail or more tailored to specific areas of practice in due course. Um, and it goes without saying, uh, if anyone has any queries on any of their cases or anything like that, wants advice uh, from me or anyone else at Farris, uh, please do not hesitate to get in contact. My email address is on the bottom of the slide there. Um, and um, I think the slides will be circulated um, in due course. Um, so thank you very much for listening and uh, I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you.